Okay, Romans 14. So I'm going to start as I always do. Um, the reason we have this letter uh, gives us the context, the picture um, of why, um, you know, of the things that Paul is saying here. Um, Paul had never been to Rome. In fact, it was the church that was started without miracle nor apostle. Um, they obviously there was people from Rome on the day of Pentecost and we see that in the book of Acts and uh, they received the Holy Spirit the church was born on the day of Pentecost and they went back and brought that fire of the gospel back into Rome the Roman church was a very Jewish church originally there was about 40,000 Jews living in ghettos uh, in Rome and it became a very Jewish church uh, one of the emperors decided that he didn't want the Jews in the country anymore and uh, he, he, he said, get out to the Jews. So the Jews had to leave. And now this very, um, this very Jewish church with a very small Gentile population now became a very small church, but, but a Gentile church. And, uh, the, but the Gentiles were very effective in evangelism. Their faith was known throughout the, or the whole known world, the Bible tells us. And so these Gentiles must have um, you know, evangelized well, prayed well, and they reached many people and they built up, you know, a, a quite significant church in Rome, um, despite the majority of the church having to be having to leave due to political reasons. Well, a new emperor come, came in and decided the Jews are actually good for the economy and they wanted them back in Rome. And the Jews are good for the economy. They, they have great business ideas. They're very, very smart. And wherever they go around the world, they prosper and they help countries to prosper. Uh, so... So the uh, emperor realized this, uh, asked the Jews to come back in. And now we're confronted with a scenario where we now have what was once a Jewish church, now a Gentile church, now the Jewish Christians coming back and wondering what happened to their church. And Paul writes Romans partly as a response um, to this situation in Rome, despite not, not visiting it or knowing the people. He prayed for them earnestly, and he could see a threat developing. And I sort of make a bit of a joke about this, that um, he was scared that there would no longer be just one denomination of Christian church, but it was possibly going to have two, and he was worried about that. Today, if you include uh, different sects, there's up to 40,000 different denominations. Right? So they all started in one accord in the upper room, and... Uh, now we've got 40,000 different groups. So Satan's done a number on us, hasn't he, in, in the name of disunity. And what we're looking at today in Romans 14 ties in really well to that. So uh, Paul was worried about this threat and he writes the, this letter and he uses the first eight chapters to talk doctrinally. He talks about faith. He he's, talks about the commonness of our faith. Yes, there's differences between Jew and Gentiles because they were given different missions, right? God chose his friend Abraham and through his lineage, he gave him a special job. Didn't love them any more than the Gentile nations, but they had an extra job to do, an extra responsibility on their shoulders. Israel was God's servant to ultimately bring the Messiah and the gospel to the whole world. So there, there, was, there was differences in, uh, in the calling of, of the Jewish church and the, and the um, Gentile church, but he had to address concerns because the Jews were puffing themselves up and thinking, oh, look at those Gentiles, you know, we've got the Torah, you know, we've had the prophets, you know, we're special, right? And, uh, and then the Gentiles were saying, well, you guys are actually being cut off and we came, we were, we were, we're now Israel, right? So God's done with you in, in, in any physical or national sense and we're, we're now taken over. But yet the eternal promises that God gave to, um, to David and to Abraham and to others will have to be fulfilled literally. So God's not done with the Jews in any national, literal or physical sense, and there will be a time. It's not now. These disciples asked just before he ascended, asked Jesus just before he ascended, is it at this time you restore the kingdom to Israel? And he, and he didn't turn around and go, no, no, that's done away with now. We're the new Israel. God's done with that. He says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Right? But, and my father does. So God's not done with the Jews, but they rejected the Messiah. They put a blood curse on themselves and their children, and they're going through some really, really rough times. Um, but that will all ultimately lead to their redemption as we look, as we were looking in Romans um, in chapters 9 to 11 we see all Israel will be saved so some very incredible event will happen where the remnant that's left um, after they've made a deal with the devil the Antichrist Christ will come they will look on him and whom they they'll look on him um, and mourn as one mourns for an only son they'll look on him whom they pierce they'll recognize they pierce their own Messiah 
they put him on a tree and, uh, and crucified him. But they'll recognize that and they'll mourn. And God won't say, well, you had your chance. He says, so will Israel be saved. So, so different destinies, um, but same gospel. And the Gentiles shouldn't be boasting against the natural root, right? Israel's the natural root with its branches. Shouldn't be saying, hey, we've replaced you. He said, hey, if I could replace the natural branches with you, I could also replace you with those natural branches again. So don't get cocky. That's, what, that's basically what he's saying there. So, so this is the context in which Paul's writing this letter. Those first eight chapters are on faith and doctrine. The next three are on the hope of Israel, chapters 9 to 11. And then these last chapters uh, talk about practical living and love. So we have faith, hope and love, the great three themes of scripture that remain eternally. And the greatest of these is love. And we're in the love section. We've gone through the doctrinal teachings, one saviour, one way, we're all sinners, all of that. We looked at Israel's future. It's not over yet for those guys, but we're in a certain season now called the year of the Lord's favour, which began at Pentecost and will finish around the time of the rapture. And then we, we uh, have love, which is last forever. And we're learning how to live in the kingdom of heaven now. God doesn't want us to wait until we're in heaven, citizens of heaven, before we start taking on the characteristics of citizens and ambassadors of this great kingdom. We are to live now. It's to be an example now. And, and we even promote to jealousy Jewish people by living in the promises of God, living in the kingdom of God now. Paul says you, you make them jealous when they see that, hang on, you're praying to a Jewish God and you know more about Abraham and David and Moses than us and you seem to be inheriting blessings in the nations that you go and, and spread the gospel, right? And, and you've got a Jewish Messiah. This must be a conundrum to the Jewish people, right? They, they must have difficulty understanding they've got they've got all our blessings and they worship the god of our forefathers like you know it, it must be a conundrum and paul says it actually brings a jealousy to them that makes them want what we've got but we want not just the jews to want what we've got we want the world to have a look and see this glorious clean holy pure kingdom come on earth and and for them to be attracted to that not by our sameness with the world are we going to win the world? It's actually our difference. It's our cleanliness. We don't need to adopt the tactics of the world. There can be truth found in, in all different kinds of things, but to, to take on the sameness of the world in order to win the world, you know, that's never going to, that's not going to work, is it? We must be different. We must be light. You know, they're, they're in darkness. We want to be light. We want to shine the light of God. And, and so here we are in Romans 14, um, looking at this, this section, um, which really talks about practical living and love. The topic today, it's, it's quite a serious topic. Paul actually, he refers to the um, judgment seat of Christ. And he uses that as to drive people away from unloving behavior. And he also implores them to respond in a loving way because your brothers and sisters in Christ um, are, are whom Christ has died for. And, and these are the two great, um, I guess, tools that Paul is using here, talking about the judgment seat of Christ and remembering that your brothers and sisters, Jesus has died for them. Those two factors should really motivate us to be a loving people. Now, loving isn't, being loving isn't being nice. You can be nice when you're loving, right? But we've got, some, we've got a very superficial view of love, I believe, not just in the world, but in the church. Love can often be synonymous with lust these days as well. And you'll hear certain groups saying love is love or love is the same. But it's also this sort of uh, don't rock the boat. It, you know, it's all being nice and lovely and smiley at church. And that's not really love. That's not bad. That's being friendly. But it's not really love. Love is sacrificial. Love limits, limits your own liberty. Love put Jesus on a cross with nails and blood and death. Okay, so love is far deeper. It's far more comforting in its result that the Father loves us, that he'd send his only son to die for us. But there's still death in that, isn't there? It's not all nice and lovely and roses. It's sacrifice and death. And when we love others, it's sacrificial. And there's a death to ourselves in that as we follow Jesus' sacrifice. We are dying every day to ourselves and ultimately we die for Christ at the end of our lives. Um, but love, love is... Love is a lot more three-dimensional than what, you know, what we've been led to believe. Let's get into it. Verse 1. Paul says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, 
but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. So this is a really good um, topic, especially for a Jewish Gentile church, but there's many applications in our lives. And that's not a slander on vegetarians there either, if you're wondering. Um, <laughs> He who is weak eats only vegetables. If you only eat vegetables, sometimes you look a bit weak, and some vegetarians are, but others are, are not. They get plenty of protein. Um, but look, the first thing that Paul is saying here is the Lord has graciously, if the Lord has given you lots of light, lots of understanding, if there's a lot of liberty in your Christian faith, then we're not to look down on others that are at a, at a different level. And when it says weaker, it doesn't mean that they don't have personal faith that might be strong it uses the word the faith right and so today we're basically looking at two types of people that we've both that we all fit into both categories at different times and stages okay we have the weaker brother and the stronger brother we can both we can be both even at the same time okay there can be certain areas of our life where we uh you know we have um you know more uh scruples or we we feel no you know i feel that's wrong or um, and and the, there can be other parts of our lives where we we'll, um, have a lot more liberty. So um, I just sort of want to make that clear as we as we get into this. Paul gives a cavity and straight away, this is really cool, because he's talking to these people that he knows what they're thinking, right? He says, for one believes he may eat all things, um, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Sorry, he, the, it's actually in the first verse. He says... Um, Receive one who's weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Right? And I read another um, translation that said, you know, um, invite a weaker brother to join you, um, but not just so you can give him your opinion. Right? Isn't that, it's like some people are like, oh, look, they're not, he's not as strong as us, you know, we, you know, he's a lot weaker in the faith, you know. Um, and then, and, but then that, can also lead to saying, well, invite him in and maybe we can show him the right way, right? And Paul's here, hey, receive a weaker brother, they're not less than you. They've got, they've got different scruples to you, right? They may, some people have grown up where the Sabbath, they couldn't, you know, they didn't do any work, they didn't drive cars, um, you know, all, they have all these different rules on a Sabbath, right? Just, and they just did it out of respect for the Lord, love the Lord, and it's traditional. And so when we come along and say, well, I have no compunction over the Sabbath, and we say, you shouldn't be doing that. That's silly. Why are you, you know, here's what the Bible says. And there's a fine line between telling people, hey, look, this is why I believe what I believe. But hey, you've got to be convinced in your own mind. I don't want to lead you into sin. Because if you, if you stop doing this, um, you know, keeping the Sabbath holy and, and you're feeling guilty about that, that actually does become sin for that person. Isn't that incredible? So there's actually a subjective um, morality as well as an objective morality in the Christian faith. There's something that can be completely normal and natural on itself for a certain person because they're feeling guilty about it, it actually becomes sin. If we don't obey our consciences in things, even things that are um, okay, um, if we're not convinced or fully convinced they're okay, we actually do it to sin, right? That becomes sin to us. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of, uh, it's, a, it's another dimension to the morality here as well. What he's talking about here when he says um, some can eat all things, but some um, only eats vegetables. If you think about it in the Jewish context, right, he's really talking about kosher. A certain way food had to be prepared. Some of it's from based on the laws of Moses, but some of it's just based by rabbis that have added a whole lot of stuff. These are all the things you can't do, you know, on the Sabbath, or these are all the um, foods that um, you can't eat and how they have to be prepared. So uh, basically... What he's saying is, you got yeah, you got, you got people coming into the church who believe that no, we've still got to be kosher, and others aren't. And what he does is he doesn't like we would do, start going, oh, that's wrong teaching. You no, know, no, you don't have to keep the, you don't have to eat certain kinds of foods. And everything's clean. Look what happened with Peter and his vision. And God said, what I've called clean, don't call unclean, right? And we, we straight away want to jump on the weaker believer or the believer that hasn't quite got there yet, or is really trying to honor God in his conscience, and he doesn't feel right about it yet. Right? And we want to jump on that person and say, hey, you've got liberty, you've got freedom. Stop observing certain days. Stop, stop denying yourself certain foods. Paul doesn't jump on that person. What he actually says is, hey, no, you're the stronger believer. You, you are stronger than you need to bear the load of the weaker brother. And you need to curb your own freedoms. Don't eat meat around him if that's going to make him feel grieved. If he feels you're sinning, don't do it. He's wrong. He's thinking you're sinning. 
And he's saying, he's not saying, yeah, well, stop thinking he's sinning. He's got liberty. Paul doesn't speak to the weaker believer here. He speaks to the stronger believer. He says, no, it's actually, you are the stronger believer. You are the mature one, right? That's what I say to my children sometimes. I go, Daniel, you're older. You're five years older. So, you know, you've got more responsibility, right? Well, that's, that's almost exactly what Paul's saying here. He's looking at the stronger, the stronger group and saying, stop pointing your finger over there. You're nutting down on theology, and you might be technically right in a sense, but that's not good enough. If he has a problem with it, don't be a stumbling block. Don't cause him to sin. In fact, go without it yourself. Even if you have to eat vegetables for the rest of your life. You know, you, yeah, it's like, that's a tough one. I thought those words would come out of my mouth. Um, but if you have to deny your own liberty, then it, it, for the sake of your brother, then do it. Um, Let's keep going. Paul says, let, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Right? So that, that's, the, that's the temptation of the stronger brother, contempt or despising. Right? You think, oh boy, you know, don't they realize that you've got Christian liberty? Look, it's okay. You, you, don't, you can watch a little bit of TV. And if you want to have a glass of wine with your meal, that's fine. And if you want to exercise on the Sabbath, that's actually not a crime. Right? There is a temptation for the stronger believer who might be okay with those areas to sort of look down and despise the one and says, ha, look, you know, they're being legalistic, right? Um, but Paul says, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And then he talks to the weaker believer here and says, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, right? And you, and there's, I mean, just because you don't eat you have a compunction over certain things that the Bible's not clear on, doesn't mean you're wrong, right? I mean, there's a lot of Christians that live very loosely and say, well, I've got Christian liberty, right? And we've got to be careful here that we're not sort of, some of the people who you would say, oh, they're a weaker believer, you know, they don't agree with celebrating Christmas or Easter and they, you know, or whatever. But it may be that the Lord has said, no, separate yourself from that stuff. That's not from me. And so on these doubtful things, as, as Paul calls it, um, we need to give. We we need to be give liberty. Our first impulse will be to despise if someone is, um, if someone has higher scruples than us, and judging is when someone oh look at the way they're living and look at what they're doing. And there may be nothing actual sinful in itself, but you know they're they're using Christian liberty that the other person doesn't feel they have and so they judge so can you see these dual temptations uh, in different situations so um, so there's two dangers when dealing with doubtful or unclear theology this is not about plain sin matters right this is about stuff that Christians have argued about forever right and and we need to just sometimes just let the other person you know be convinced themselves um, so there's yeah the two dangers one's for the stronger and one's for the weaker for the stronger there's a temptation to look down on or despise those who seem to have less freedom in christ than them and they may have no compunction about the sabbath or other holy days or about kosher foods alcohol etc for the weaker brother who feels it's wrong to work on the sabbath or to eat pork or drink alcohol the temptation is to judge others as not being as enlightened or as holy as them and they could be right and they could be wrong but that's not the point Paul's trying to get it away from the issue. He's trying to get them, it's like two dogs going at a bone. He's saying, look, let's put the bone away and look at how you guys are relating to each other here. Okay, how do we have theological debates in respectful, loving ways that doesn't feel like we're kicking and dragging someone to do something against their conscience, right? We shouldn't be putting any pressure on people's conscience. And it's a bigger deal than I've realized reading this and really studying this, it's a big deal to God if you try to pull people to do things against their conscience. It's really big. And Paul uses really big language about it. Um, so the problem with this is it's not always clear whether one is the stronger believer or just holds a lower standard of holiness and whether the weaker believer is weaker or believes the Lord has called them to a higher living and greater holiness, okay? So there's a big cloud around it anyway. We can't always determine, well, is he just being legalistic or is he actually really trying to be holy, loves the Lord and doesn't want to touch that stuff? Or, you know, and then you get the opposite on the, with the person using their liberty when they're saying, well, I've got all this freedom in Christ. I'm bold. I can, I can have this and I don't mind. Um, you know, I can, I'm fine with watching TV. I'm just disciplined with how I do it and uh, I've got no compunction about the Sabbath or having to worship on a certain day, right? And they're both sort of, they're in this individual rights kind of thing. And they're not looking at the other's need and they're not looking at, um, and they're not looking in love either, either of them. 
so because of this, uh, Paul says, we are not to judge because we don't know where the other person's at. And because sin isn't, isn't as clear, clearly, if, if sin can be affected by your conscience, <laughs> then it's hard to say, is that right or wrong? You can say yes and no. It's wrong for him, right for him, wrong for him, right, right for him, right? So overall, it's something that's not sinful, but this person has a problem in their conscience about it. It is sin for them. And it's wrong for you to drag another believer to do something against their conscience, even if it's the right teaching. Even if the Lord has come in a blinding light and said, hey, you don't need to, do, you don't need to observe the Sabbath. It's not your job now to go out there and tell every person who tries to honour the Lord in a special way on the Sabbath to come kicking and screaming to your viewpoint because you're absolutely certain you had an experience with God. Okay? Because it may not be sin for you, but you've just caused your brother to sin because he, in his conscience, whether it's through tradition or something he read or the denomination he came from, that was something special. And he feels that if he doesn't observe it, there's something wrong in his conscience and it has become sin. Paul goes on to say, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. The way Paul says that, it's like he's saying, stop trying to convince everyone else and just get convinced yourself. i tell you what, when you're trying to convince other people of your point of view all the time, day in and day out, it's often because you've got your own doubts about it. Right? You, if you can convince other people, I mean, people of the world do this for Christians to get them to sin with them, right? They know in their heart it's not right, but if they can convince all these good guys, oh, it's okay, I'm not that bad, then they sort of feel better about it too. Paul's saying the same with doctrine. Just get yourself convinced. Okay? Don't think you, you know, you, you're going to convert everyone to your viewpoint on every uh, point of doubtful theology, theology that's about doubtful things, right? We've got to hold back that drive to go in with the zealot of truth and to fix everyone's theology because in the meantime, we may be crushing people for whom Christ died and we're not to do it like that. That's not to say we don't correct theology. It's not to say we don't state our viewpoints. In fact, Paul states his viewpoint very clearly in a, in a few more verses, what he believes. He states it, he's got no problem with that. In fact, he argues for it in different places in the scripture. But that's different to saying, you know, you must believe what I believe or you're wrong, right? Especially if people have a conscience issue for it. So he says, so instead of convincing others, let, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat and gives God thanks. So think about it, right? What's the, what, why is this even a problem? It's because you've got two groups of believers that really, really want to please the Lord. And one thinks, oh, these certain things are wrong and I don't want to do that. I want to be right before the Lord. And the other wants to access, uh, use his, his liberty because, you know, that's what Christ died for. We have this Christian liberty and we're freed from the law and Right? They're both, but what are they both trying to do? They're both trying to please the Lord. So stop bickering. Stop pointing it out. Stop trying to drag one to the other position. They're both in their own minds at the light that they've got at this current stage, trying to honor and please the Lord. And yes, maybe in time through gentle conversation or through prayer for that person, they may become fully convinced. It's not your job to convince, but God may use you to have conversations with people about different areas of theology and look at scriptures in doubtful areas. But it's not your job to drag them kicking and screaming to your viewpoint. They are actually in more sin if they come to the right theology on that, but don't have ease in their conscience than if they're in the wrong camp and just didn't do it just in case. Do you understand that? We can actually be dragging people into sin by getting them to believe the right theology, but at a time when they're not ready to accept it and therefore sin against their own conscience. Verse 7, he goes on to say, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. Paul is now bringing in Christ into all this. Let's have a think about this. You're down in the mud playing with these little issues about food and days and dates and you're really wanting everyone, trying to fix everyone's... Let's just settle down here. Your whole life is Jesus's. It's not about you. It's not about what you want, right? Um, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Um, so it's not about our individual rights or freedoms, uh, nor is it about judging others who are at different points in their walk with the Lord. Everything is about the Lord, not us. He must always remain in the primary place in the believer's life. 
Paul now brings in the judgment seat of Christ. He says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Uh, Derek Prince gives the example of, um, of a whole lot of people in a courtroom and the judge is yet to enter the room and you go up and, t- and sit in the seat of the judge. <clears throat> what do you think would happen? How long do you think you'd last in that position, right? Yet when we take on God's role to judge our brothers, our brothers and sisters, um, we, that's what we're doing. And it's not just like in an earthly court. This is God's court, right? God is going to ultimately deal with people's theology, especially on secondary issues we're talking about here. It's doubtful things is the whole category here, right? <clears throat> when do we have the right to judge? Where we have a responsibility. Where we've got responsibility, we are given also the authority to judge. So if you're sort of a leader in a church, Okay, you've got the responsibility to make sure if there's sin in the church or your sexual immorality going on, you're calling out the sin, you're rebuking the person, you're handing them over to Satan, you're doing all the things they do in the scriptures. That's when you have the authority to judge. But this is talking about, you know, between equal believers, right? Sort of brothers and sisters in the family. When we're talking on those levels, um, we're not to judge, right? We're not to judge. Now, now remember, there's a few different words for judge and da- Daniel helped that out with his great great series on that as well but what we're ultimately looking there's an ultimate word for judging that means a final judgment okay passing judgment like a judge would do that's different to criticos or discernment right because you've got to judge you've got to go oh, is he is he right or not you know is, is what he's saying of god or not is that matching up with the scriptures that's all judging we've got to do that 24 7 right you, you judge from the moment you get out of bed you judge whether you're going to have your coffee or or your shower first right we're always using that kind of judgment but to pass judgment to show this contempt or to despise your brother who's not using Christian liberties or to judge other Christians. I know some Christians feel that they can never be alone with the opposite sex in public or private, public or private. So they they would say you can't, you know, even have a coffee at a coffee shop or whatever. It's all in public and, you know, so it's not not temptation. But some would say, no, I think that's wrong. It's an appearance of evil. And I've been judged for that. Like people go, really? judgy on that right and that's fine if that's what they believe but when they tried to put that onto me right that's, the bible doesn't actually say that there's no chapter and verse you can quote that you're if you're sitting down with the opposite sex that you what do you need a chaperone right so and i don't want to criticize people that have that point of view there might be some very good reasons and you know i'm not here to to argue the other side um but you know i, I think we need to um, be level-headed and use some common sense as well Uh, It's very helpful to remind ourselves when we feel like judging another brother um, for their view or brother or sister for their view um, or conscience on a secondary issue that we will have to stand before the judgment throne of Christ one day. And in fact, we'll have to give an account not just for our actions, but for every idle word we speak. And by your words, you will be acquitted and by your words, you'll be condemned. That's the words of Jesus. So we've got to be careful, the words. We've got to be careful. We can't just throw around criticisms of people, of other believers, right? I mean, one um, American Bible teacher suggests that the biggest reason why many Christian children walk away from the faith is that they come from households where the parents are, are always criticizing other churches and other Christians all the time. And they grow up thinking, well, why would I want, why would I want any part of that, right? So I don't know what facts they have for that, but, but you can see we are not to be constantly running people down. Paul describes it in, in a moment here as destroying the work of Christ in their lives. We've got to be careful how we speak about others. Err on the side of caution. Of course, when people are like wolves, man, we've got to warn. We've got to warn people about that, absolutely. And we've got to love people enough to say the tough things to them too, right? But on secondary, if they're closed on this sort of secondary issue, then we're not, again, grabbing them, kicking and screaming or judging them or saying, oh, yeah, oh, he doesn't believe this and doesn't believe that and doesn't do that to other believers and, and running them down. No, because that could cause a grievance, an offense, a hurt. They might walk away from the church or from the Lord, right? And these are people for whom Christ died. 
So remember, you're going to stand before God one day and every negative word you spoke about other pastors, other churches, other people, and, and there may be good reasons to do that at times, but just remember when you are doing that to be careful because you will have to give an account for all those words. So let's just make sure that the words that we're using have been considered, that they're in love, that they're necessary and that they're Holy Spirit led. Okay, verse 14. I know and am convinced <coughs> by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. So Paul states his opinion right away. He's saying, hey, on, the, on this whole thing about whether, you know, food can be clean or unclean, whether it's kosher or not, I'm clear. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus. So it's a pretty strong statement. He's clearly stating what he believes. He's not entering into contention about doubtful things. But he's clearly stating in a very strong way, I know and am convinced. Who? Who by, who by the Lord Jesus Christ? By the Lord Jesus Christ, I know and am convinced that there's nothing unclean of itself. Then he goes on to say, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, it, to him it is unclean. You know, if, if people have this problem with eating various kinds of foods, maybe it's a, a Jewish believer, that's uh, a Jewish man that's just been, become a Christian, right? And they've never eaten pork or bacon, you know? I heard a story, a man, the first time he, he decided he'd eat bacon, now he was a Christian, didn't have those compunctions. He sort of closed his eyes and chewed the bacon, wondering if he was going to be struck by something. But, but this, <laughs> this kind of tradition and programming, like people, you know, we grow up, you know, our upbringing it really determines a lot of this stuff. Some people couldn't have a sip of alcohol without feeling I've sinned against the Lord God Almighty, right? And it's not for us to come into some big theological argument with them in order to drive them kicking and screaming to do something that they have just, it's been really ground in them, right? Cultural, traditional upbringing. These are the things that Paul's talking about. Things that he's saying they're not unclean in themselves. And people might come down on different sides, whether, you know, what the Bible says about, about some of these topics too. But in, in the end, there's a lot of these topics that seem unsettled and they're unsettled to people. Um, yet if your brother's grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. See how silly it starts to sound when Paul starts to be talking about food on one hand, <laughs> types of food you're allowed to eat, and talking about the potential of being destroying. Uh, do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Someone could be destroyed. They be could become grieved because of your food. And you start to go, this is crazy. If people are going to get destroyed because of what I'm eating around them, I'm not going to have pork or bacon or anything. I'm, not going, to, I'm going to make sure I'm not just catering for the person that doesn't want pork or bacon. I'm just going to make sure we all don't have pork or bacon at, that, at the dinner I run, right? Because I know there's a couple of people here that, don't, that ha came from that Jewish background or have some other compunction about it. And I'm not going to be a stumbling block. It's just food. There's other meats out there. And if they think you shouldn't eat any meat, then okay. You can get some pretty good vegetarian dishes these days right got some good cooks at our coffee shop and they convinced me you, you know you can have some great tasting vegetarian dishes um, so Paul says he'd prefer that than destroying his brother for whom Christ died right this is the gravity he, he's taken it taking it up a, up a notch so what he's saying here is um, there's two ways in which it can be wrong to eat something that's clean one is to eat it with a guilty conscience, like I said, like a newly converted Jew, and the other is to cause grief or a stumbling block to your brother. It's not maturity to parade your Christian freedom. It is unloving. Love limits liberty, right? Love will limit liberty, right? Love would way prefer to take on either legalistic things themselves because they know that they're just... No, their brother's not ready for that. So look, yeah, when I go over there, I, I don't drink any alcohol. I know he doesn't like that. And we don't do much on the Sabbath. I can organize the mission trip around that. We, don't, we can have a break on the Sabbath, right? That's what they do. Something else that goes, no, shouldn't they be the one changing their theology so I can live, you know, as, as, with the Christian liberty that I have? And, but Paul says, no, the Holy Spirit says, no. He says, no, you're the stronger believer. You've got to bear with him and you, you love him, you pray for him and they'll get to a point where they will come into a greater liberty. And then you can, you can increase your liberty with him. Hey, if you're by yourself at your home or, you know, you're not with other believers that could possibly stumble, that's different too. And you can live by your own Christian liberties there. But Paul is saying, you know, he put himself under the law, you know. Didn't he get Titus circumcised? 
Like he 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 said to win a Jew, he became a Jew. It's like he would he would eat kosher. He would go to the synagogues. He did that when he was amongst the Gentiles. He did other things, right? So he was happy to do all that. He used all those cultural things, knowing they were neutral, but he could use them for the gospel. He knew he could act in love, right, for his fellow believers who didn't get it quite yet. They'd only been, you know, Jewish Christians for not very long, and they've got this Jewish history forever. And he knew that he could just go, that's fine, I can give up that right, I can give up that, I don't have to eat meat, I can do this, I can do that. And that way I won't spoil any of these Christians, I won't put a stumbling block or an offence in their lives, that we won't give them something to accept that they just can't right now, but they, but they may be able to down the track, right? That's what Paul's doing here. Our Christian family should be so precious to us that we should happily surrender any liberty if it would preserve their faith. The onus is on the stronger brother to not restrict their liberties, uh, to, to restrict their liberties, not on the weaker one to do something their conscience is not ready for. I said that a bit confusingly, but I think you get the point, right? It's the one who has the liberty should be restricting his liberties until the weaker one uh, has a strong enough conscience um, to be able to not um, sin when they um, participate in that. Verse 16, Paul says, Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Right? So you may have a fully convinced conscience on something. He's saying that's good. That's good. But don't let that good be spoken of as evil to those who have different understandings. You understand that? If you're out and you're trying to witness to Jewish people and you just, you know, you have a pig on a spit and you know, and they, they they're gonna think yeah, they're gonna think man, this guy is so far gone, right? Why would you do that? Oh, I'm exercising my liberty. I'm showing them. They'll get jealous because bacon smells great, right? No, that's not the kind of jealousy Paul is referring to when he says making people jealous. Um, that actually will offend and grieve people and could be a blockage to the gospel. Paul says just use every mechanism that you have to remove offence uh, from people to remove grievance, everything you can so that you can uh, reach people or if they're believers, so you can uh, keep them in the faith. You don't destroy what good work God's already done in their lives because, um, because they're you know, a new Christian and it's all fragile at that point. Um, yeah, so therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So uh, Paul's contrasting again, saying, look, it's not about eating and drinking, guys. The Christianity, where'd you get messed up with that? <laughs> Why are you guys fighting over this kind of stuff or whether it's observing days or whatnot? Just look, leave those doubtful things alone for now, right? It, the kingdom of God is actually about righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In fact, you can't get peace or joy without righteousness first. That's why the order is important there. Uh, you, a right, there's no rest for the wicked. There's no peace for the wicked. Okay, So um, the kingdom of God is about holiness. It's holy living, being right. Righteousness generally refers to our relationships with others. Godliness or holiness is generally a vertical relationship between us and the Lord. So uh, being righteous is having those right relationships with others. Being, you know, do not... Uh, murder, do not covet, do not lie. This hurts other people, right? And then we've got the vertical commands um, where do not have any other gods, idols, um, and, and the others that refer to our relationship with the Lord. So he's saying righteousness, peace. Okay? Peace is so important. The world can never have peace. We're the only ones with a shot. And the Prince of Peace is coming to set up a kingdom of peace. But in the meantime, we want to live as citizens of the kingdom. I wonder if we value the peace enough peace between brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we might be quick to rebuke, quick to turn, quick to fight, quick to grab our own rights. Um, we may do it all in the name of theology and a good cause, but blessed are the peacemakers, aren't they? Right? Bringing peace, bringing down the tone of an argument, not breaking the peace. This is something highly valuable. This is what the, the kingdom of God's about. First, righteousness, right relationships with others, do no harm, love does no harm, peace, and then out of that comes joy the joy of the Lord and we are, our, our primary joy is uh, in fellowship together right? Fellow, when the word fellowship means sharing Christ together it was a word coined for Christian youth, use fellowship it's sharing Christ together and that's where our joy comes from right and the joy of the Lord's our strength 
Rather put, um, yeah, so rather put things in perspective. The kingdom of God is not about food, drink, or calendars. It is about righteousness, peace, and joy. And these things are acceptable to God and approved by man. There's no controversy in the body of Christ. Look, he believes in peace, and I'm more for war. You know, he's for righteousness. I'm for ungodly sin, sinful living. Right? There's no. Uh, he's for joy. I'm for mourning or, um, or depression. Right? These things are accepted by God and approved by men. They're uncontroversial characteristics of the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, so therefore is a very important word in the scriptures. Um, if you get a therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. So he's saying based on everything that's said beforehand about the kingdom of God, about the judgment seat of Christ, about potentially destroying a brother um, because you want to fix their theology. It says... Um, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure. Again, Paul states his own belief. Uh, he didn't believe in kosher anymore. Right? Peter had the vision um, when he was in copper and uh, he, God opened up a blanket, a tarp, some description, um, with different animals and said kill and eat and there was unclean animals there and he's saying it put, Peter was about to go in Acts 10 to Cornelius's house and the first Gentiles were going to be converted he would have been probably having lunch at their house there was probably going to be some pork on the table so God is preparing him and saying hey what I've called clean uh, do not call unclean and he told him you know, a number of times kill and eat and that had to have a big adjustment but who did it who fixed Peter's theology there God did, okay? Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. In fact, Paul said, I know and am convinced by, by the Lord Jesus Christ, not by Peter the Apostle or Titus, or he said, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is primarily, um, we need sometimes the Lord to reveal things to us and to fix up those traditions, biases and cultural things that we've come out of in order to, um, to have that Christian liberty and for it no longer to be a sin. In, in those areas so do not uh, destroy the work of God for the sake of food all things indeed are pure but it is evil for the man who eats with offense it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak you know we've got this offense culture these days don't we sometimes there's grounds for you know, like we want to we wanna go, well, it's their fault. You can't give offence. You can only take it. And I love that line because, you know, people get really offended at what, the gospel and about what Christians say about marriage and various things, right? And, and, uh, and you've got to have a good argument back for that stuff because you're trying to win them away from their bad theology, I guess. Um, but sometimes, especially in the family, right, in the, in the body of Christ, We've got to go, well, it's not his problem. You take offense, so I couldn't help that. You no, know, we've got to look, that could possibly happen. I don't want him to be offended. Uh, you know, Paul saw the whole world as people for whom Christ died. And we've got to see all these people that he saw, all the lost and the believers and the family, he's seeing them for, for uh, you know, people for whom Christ died. And when we see people with that great value and we could fear that we can be destroying Christ's a powerful, miraculous work in their lives through causing offense, then Paul not only... It wasn't just of the negative, trying not to, not to cause offence. He actually went on the offensive, and it's like he looked ahead and said, "You know, look, be sensitive to the people, be sensitive to your audience. What's what are the people in your church like? What do they care about? What what compulsion? What convictions do they have? And then adjust your attitude and your liberties. Reduce your liberties to the lowest common denominator in a church. That's what we all should do. You know, we all reduce it to the level of the weakest believer who might have all kinds of problems." That they're getting over well we'll reduce it and we'll bring him up with us and then maybe we'll all increase our liberty together okay but initially that person may not be able to anymore listen to worldly music right and it's fine for other people but they've just come out of the nightclub scene and use drugs and all of this and they can't i know some someone who couldn't listen to classical music because they always would take drug trips and listen to classical music and go into that well then you know, be at home group, don't put on any classical music if that person's there, right? It's not being legalistic, it's called being loving. It's restricting yourself voluntarily out of love to that believer so he doesn't get harmed, so the work of Christ isn't destroyed in his life in any way. 
Um, and, and I pose this question, why should I be restricting my Christian liberties for someone that's being legalistic? The answer is because in Christ's kingdom, it's not for the strong to devour the weak. It's not survival of the fittest or might is right. It's the responsibility of the stronger brother or sister to uphold the weak. You know, in the new city, in the new Jerusalem, guess what position the apostles hold or where the apostles' names are? The apostles aren't at the top of the gates. They're in the foundations. Right? Apostle, another word for sent one or leader, right? In a, um, not thinking of the capital A sense, but that the, it wasn't about down, downward authority, right? Putting things on people and getting them to do. It's actually, the apostle is actually, if you ever look at those hierarchy like pyramids, you've got like the boss and then there's two people under them and five people under them, and, right? It's actually, it's upside down pyramid, Right? And the apostle is bearing the whole church on his back. He's got leaders on his and they've got leaders on them. Right? It's actually the opposite. He lays down his life just like Christ did. Okay? No, one, he was, no man was his master, but he was the servant of all. That's the difference when it's voluntary. And that's what, if you're a leader, or we're all leaders. When we're, de- when we're dealing with a, a younger Christian or we're discipling someone, right? then we are leaders at that time. And it's not to sort of tell them you know, how it all works and, and then they're sort of like your little underling and run around doing what you ask, right? You're to bear them up and their weaknesses. And, you, and if they're not ready for something, then you're to take that blow. You know, you're meeting with them and you can't eat meat or burgers or whatever it is because they've got a problem with that. They're just still coming out of whatever they used to be involved in, right? That's what we're meant to do. The foundation stones are where the apostles' names are written in the New Jerusalem because they are underneath everyone holding everything up, right? And who's the chief cornerstone? Christ, right? He's a chief cornerstone. He's undergirding the entire foundations of the building. He's the ultimate servant. And we follow his example, not to lord our liberties over people, but to give them up in love so, um, so the weaker brother can um, not have their faith destroyed. Okay, and let's finish with the, the last two verses here. Do you, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. That's what I was saying earlier. Look, if you've got great faith and you, and you feel you're not bound by that stuff and you're fine with eating whatever and um, you don't need to celebrate certain days and you, and you don't have compunction about you know, a whole lot of things, that's great. But have it to yourself before God. When you're by yourself, that's fine. Use and exercise that liberty. That's great. It's a blessing. It's wonderful. But when you're around others, limit your liberties. He says, happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. That's a powerful statement. We can approve things that are right with people and we can condemn ourselves because we're, we're basically dragging people along to our theological viewpoint, right? Paul didn't want to go, look, I don't think anything's unclean, right? But it, by approving it for other people whose consciences weren't ready for that, he would have condemned himself. Isn't that amazing? You can approve something that's right, but by doing that to the wrong person, you're actually leading them into sin, to, to sin against their conscience. And then Paul says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. That's a pretty, Paul sums up his whole argument in this, in this final statement um, because he does not eat from faith. Uh, sorry, uh, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Isn't that incredible? But really, that's really the only option we have. We either act in faith, right? We're acting, doing it in God's ways, in his strength, or we're doing it ourselves in doubt or unbelief, right? So Paul puts a, um, a full stop with that final statement. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So it's not enough just to have your theology right. You need to, um, you need to treat people right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this word, this message, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will... Um, take this word further into our lives, Lord, that we'll not only be hearers of the word, but doers of it. Help us, Lord, to act in love. We're in such a society where it's individual rights all the time, Lord. Lord, how much we would stand out when we lay down our rights for others so that they can have their faith strengthened, that we wouldn't destroy the work of Christ in other believers' lives because we think it's their problem or I don't see why they get offended or they're wrong. Lord, help us. This way, it's a very high way, this way of love. It's not just platitudes and nice talk and smiles. 
there's sacrifice, there's limiting of liberties, sometimes there's giving our own lives, Lord. Lord, we pray that you'll give us your Holy Spirit to help us, Lord. Your kingdom is about righteousness, peace and joy. Let that be our chief concern too, in Jesus' name. Amen.